Hi, I'm Christy Maver, VP of Marketing at Numenta, here with Jeff Hawkins, co-founder at Numenta and author of A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence, which we're talking about today in our video series covering the book. Um, so this is our third video in the series. Today, we're going to talk about part two of the book. Part two is called Machine Intelligence. So in our last conversation, when we talked about part one, uh, you talked about how a new understanding of the brain is part one, which really covers the thousand brains theory of intelligence, the discoveries along the way that led to the creation of that theory. Um, and really part two is then about the impact of the theory um, on the future of AI and machine intelligence. Um, so one of the one of my first questions is you talk about how there's no I in AI in this section. So why is that? Why aren't today's machines intelligent? Uh, well, uh, so that's you know it's interesting. We, as I I mentioned earlier in the previous video, you know we we start out our our research is really primarily focused on neuroscience and the brain how it works. Uh, although we're a bunch of engineers as well as scientists, and so we're interested in AI as well. But as we learn more and more about how the brain actually creates intelligence and what intelligence is, uh, then it became much more clear focus about uh, what today's AI is and how it's different than the biological AI or biological intelligence. And, um, and it's striking. And so we, I, I decided we should write about this. Um, so now we do have a chapter, chapter eight says, why is there no I in AI or why, you know, I'm basically arguing that today's AI is not really intelligent. Um, and it gets back to uh, something I mentioned in the previous video, which is, you know, what is intelligence? Intelligence is, is at its core is ability to learn a model of the world. And that model uh, is very detailed and complicated. So when we know something, you know, if we know what a, a door is or a car is, or we know how to, you know, use something like a stapler, um, or we know some language, or we know some mathematics, and so on. We know this information. Um, it's not just you know some pattern that we're exposed to. We store it in our head in this model, and the model has, uh, and that's part of the theory. The model is all based on these reference frames or how information is stored in the model, mm -hmm. and so that allows us to act upon it. it allows us to have sort of. Uh, it, it gives a, the, the theory explains that the intelligence is based on this model and the model has structure to it. Like the knowledge, the knowledge of the world has structure that you can act upon. And today's AI doesn't really have that structure. Today's AI is like a, is a very sophisticated pattern matching system. You can kick an input in and you can classify it. But, you know, if I have a, if I have, a, a, you know, something, a, a, an example I use in the book, if I say, okay, here's pictures and the AI today says that's a picture of a cat or you might even say that's a picture of a cat playing over the ball. But that system doesn't really know what a ball is or what a cat is. It doesn't know that cats are animals, that they have, they probably have livers and spleens, that they have fur, that they have nails, that they like to be petted, that they're cat people and dog people. You know, what is, you know, what, how do you clean up after a cat? I mean, it does nothing of that. And we all, did, we learned that as children, right? We learned this is sort of our basic knowledge of the world. And, and so, what we've discovered is how is that basic common knowledge stored in your head? And, and we know now that nothing like that is equivalent in today's AI. So today's AI is a very shallow level sort of understanding of the world. And I don't think you can um, get to what, what AI scientists and, and people in general want to get to, which is truly intelligent machines. Um, you can't get there um, just doing what we're doing today. You have to sort of incorporate these principles uh, from the brain. So I, in the book, I lay out a series of these principles. I say, these are the sort of the core basic things you got to have in a system for it to be intelligent. And uh, I make that argument. It's a novel argument. And so uh, I'm sure um, some people will push back on it, but I think a lot of people might embrace it as well. Um, so uh, it's not just I'm being critical of AI. I'm saying, look, it's great what we've done so far, but it is, it is really far away from what we need to get to. And here's a list of the things that we've learned from the brain um, that um, intelligent systems really should have or need to have, not just should, they have to have. They have to, to have. To, be, to have to have to be intelligent. Yeah. So I think one of the chapter titles that, that jumps out and will probably jump out to other people as well in this section is chapter nine, which is when machines are conscious. So what, why is that chapter in there and, and what is that about? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's um, in my previous book uh, on intelligence, which I wrote about 15 years ago, I had a little bit about consciousness in there. And I was surprised how many people asked me, 
I wish you wrote more about consciousness. Um, and so I took that to heart on this book and, uh, and I put a lot more effort into that. Uh, and I think it's something that people are concerned about. I mean, people are concerned about what's the nature of consciousness in general, human consciousness, you know, what are we, what does it mean to be conscious? How can I feel this way? Um, but then the, it comes up a, a different way to look at it and say, well, okay, let's, let's ask about a machine that's doing something the same as a brain. Would it be conscious and why and under what conditions? And so I explore that in this chapter. Um, I start off in the chapter with a, a story about how I was attending a lecture and a philosopher said that if machines were conscious, uh, then we would be obligated not to turn them off, like unplug them. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's an interesting proposition. <laughs> you know, is that true? Uh, is that murder? <laughs> you know? So it got me thinking. So I built this case around that. Um, and I, I, I'm probably just right up front about it. I'll give a give away part of the, the, the chapter. Um, is that uh, I think machines can be conscious. It's not something that just magically appears. There's a certain set of things you have to be able, the machine has to have to be conscious. And if it doesn't have those things, it won't be conscious. And same with humans. Humans have to have these. If we don't, we wouldn't be conscious. Um, and I won't go through all of them right now, but uh, just to give you a flavor of it, um, uh, one, of the, one of the things about, you know, again, the book is a lot about how we build this model of the world in our head. Um, and we, we remember things all the time. Oh, constantly updating our model. Every time I see anything, I update it. If I see something's moved on the table, I update my model of where that thing is. And if I see a new piece of food in the refrigerator, I update my model of what the world is like. And so one of the parts of things we actually store in our model of the world is our thoughts. We actually store our thoughts about what we did a moment ago. What we were thinking a moment ago was part of our experience. And we remember that just the same way as I saw a coffee cup on the table, I can say, I was thinking about getting ice cream in the kitchen. And, um, and, and a, one of the key components of consciousness is the ability to not just experience in the moment, but remember what you experienced moments ago or even a long time ago. You literally record your thoughts and they become part of the model of the world. And so when I, when I get to the kitchen, I say, why did I come to the kitchen? It's because I remember a moment ago, I was thinking about getting some ice cream. So there's this idea that you can slide your, your, your current perception from the present back into the past and also into the future that gives you this sense that you're in the present, that I, that I exist in the world. Uh, that's one of the components is there's other ones too. But anyway, I do make the case in the book that a machine can be conscious if we give it the these set of ingredients that I, I outline. And, um, but I then make the distinction between, um, you know, what are our moral obligations to a conscious machine? Um, what are our, you know, and so going back to the initial question, like, can we unplug it? And this is where um, something you and I haven't talked about yet about the book, but I talk a lot about the older parts of the brain in the book. These are not parts that aren't the neocortex, but these older sections of the brain. And these are where all of our emotions come from and these are where our fears come from. So when we fear death, for example, it's really the older parts of the brain that evolved long, long time ago that are fearing death. Um, it's not the neocortex, it's not the intelligent part. It's really the older parts of the brain that fear death or fear pain and things like that. And um, when we build intelligent machines, we do not have to build those older parts of the brain. In fact, we shouldn't. I make the argument in the book, we shouldn't build those older parts. We don't want to build human-like machines. Uh, you can be intelligent and not have the same emotions as a human or the same fears as a human or the same desires of a human at all. In fact, intelligence doesn't create those desires. That, that has to be, intelligence is really just to build it a model of the world. And so intelligent machines, do not have to fear death, and and it, it, and there would be no moral obligation to them to turn them off. Just like, you know, we go to sleep at night and we we kind of turn off for eight hours and turn back on again. It's not a big deal, you know. Um, even if in a machine, if I turned it off and never plugged it in again, it wouldn't matter, uh, unless unless we went out of our way in a big way to make them fear and have the same sort of emotional impact about the world as we do, uh, which I don't think we should can right at the moment, and I don't think we should. So I end up to include that chapter explaining what I think intelligence is and then say, yeah, and machines can be intelligent, but they're not gonna be like humans and we don't have to worry about them. Right. Well, consciousness is always, uh, always generates some interesting conversations. So yeah. I'm sure the chapter will as well. There's a, there's a lot of co controversy about con uh, consciousness and I'm sure the position I take will, it, it, it runs contrary to what some people believe and I'm sure they'll, um, they'll have a few things to say about that. But I feel I'm pretty, pretty comfortable about it. Uh, yes, I know. I, I, I wouldn't have put it in the book if I didn't feel comfortable about it. 
us. There's also a chapter on <clears throat> the existential risks of machine intelligence, and uh, and and people may be surprised by some of your what you um, have to say in that chapter. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is really along the lines of why we shouldn't, we don't need to fear uh, machine intelligence. Can you talk well, about that? Well, yeah, so I, well, so as just to make sure uh, people listening to this, I'm sure most people know this, but there's been a lot of concern recently about AI, not necessarily, I mean, there's two concerns. AI is a powerful technology and people can abuse it. That's, uh, that's true, I'm not denying that at all. Um, but there's a different level of concern that's come up with this is sort of the existential risk of AI. Um, and uh, you've seen famous technologists and philosophers and other and authors of different types claiming that, you know, hey, we're creating these intelligent machines and they're going to be smarter than humans and they're going to take over the world or we won't be able to control them or they won't, uh, they won't adhere to our desires. And, and there's a whole different number of scenarios that come out of this where somehow we lose control and humans are doomed, um, you know, <laughs> we're taken over by the... Yeah our creations. Um, this is a serious thing. A lot of people are worried about this. And, uh, I, I, and, I, and I respect these people. I don't want to dismiss it. Um, however, and, uh, however, I think almost all those fears were based on, a, without a deep understanding of what it means to be intelligent. And, and so the assumption is it's like to be intelligent is to be like a human. And so they kind of imagine like, oh, a super intelligent machine is like a human and just a super intelligent human and they'll do bad things just like humans do bad things. Um, and in this chapter, I, 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 I really make the distinction uh, between machines that are smart, but they don't have to be, have any of the emotions and drives and, and they won't have any of the emotions and drives unless we give it to them. That is intelligence is the ability to model the world and it's not a desire to, to procreate or it's not a desire to dominate or you know these are things that are old parts of the brain that evolved a long time ago and so when we create ai they can be super smart but they don't have to be anything like humans at all i make the analogy in the book which i i'll share here is you can think about um people have uh, uh created a model of the earth which is maps you know back from for over the last several hundred years hundreds of years um, people are trying to understand what the world is really like, and they created maps and, and maps. And, and, and maps is a form of knowledge. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, in, it's an, in, in a map allowed people to do things. They allowed people to be successful. They allowed them to be traders. They allowed them to be warriors. They allowed them to do discoveries and so on. And, but the maps themselves had no desires, right? It's a model of the world, but it, on its own, it doesn't say, I want to you know, dominate and kill these people, or I want to trade peacefully with these people here. And the, the map itself, it was sort of, it's analogous to our brain. It has a map of the model of the world. And, but how it's used is independent of that. So intelligent machines are like a map of the world. They, they, they will be, they'll be, they'll have a very detailed understanding of model of the world, but how it's applied determines whether it's good or bad. And intelligence itself does not dictate that and will not come about on its own. Maps don't, didn't start automatically started dominating the world. You know, they didn't do that. <laughs> so it's, that's an analogy, um, but I think it's a good one. And I developed that um, to, to basically make the point that um, AI does not represent an existential threat. I don't want to dismiss the idea that truly intelligent machines are not powerful tools that could be abused by humans. Um, I think that is true. And we have to be very, very careful about that. In the same way, we have to be careful about nuclear weapons, or we have to be careful about uh, people's ability to um, modify genes and so on. These are powerful technologies that we have to be careful about because some people will abuse them. But on its own, AI is not an existential threat. There's, there's going to be no runaway explosion of intelligence. I, I, I talk about that concept too in the book. Right, right. Um, so yeah, I know that will be a, a somewhat controversial chapter. Well, you know, each part of the book is is really like it's its own book as well. Yeah. So I, I think anyone who's interested in these these types of conversations or interested in just AI in general, I think will really enjoy part two. Yeah. I, I should point out, and we'll talk about when we come, when we come back to talk about part three of the book, is um, I think we should build intelligent machines. I think we will build intelligent machines. It will be one of the dominating uh, dominant technologies of the 21st century. Uh, it will impact. The, the world in the same way that computers impact the world in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, and I think there's some really, really wonderful things that are kind of coming out of that. 
Um, and we'll just have to learn to control the downsides in the same way there are some wonderful things that came out of computing. Um, this tremendous number of benefits to medicine, science, you know, life. Um, yet we still have we still have problems with it, and people abuse it. Um, so um, uh, anyway, I, I think this is going to be a theme for the, the over the next uh, this century. It's going to be a big thing. Well, we'll talk more uh, in when we discuss part three of the book, Human Intelligence. And A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence is available for pre-order now on Amazon. And we'll put a link in the YouTube description. Thanks for your time today, Jeff. And All I look right. forward to talking about the last section. Yeah, we got one more three. here. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you in a second.